Hey everyone, on uh, this show of On.net, I've got Kyle Marsh with me today, a program manager for uh, uh, Microsoft Identity, and he's here to talk to us about uh, .NET Core services and MSOL and how to authenticate these against Azure AD. Join us. Welcome back, everyone, on uh, today's On.NET show. I've got Kyle Mars, Program Manager for the Identity Division, uh, with us. And he's going to talk about MSAL for .NET developers and um, how to do it when you're writing services. Hey, Kyle. Nice to have you Hi. here, man. Thanks. Nice to be here. How are you on this sunny day? Uh, very good. Very good. Okay. It's not too hot, so the fans aren't having to go too hard. Perfect. <laughs> so. Uh, in this series, we cover different things about identity, and uh, in this instance, you're here to talk to us about MSAL and uh, with regards especially to .NET services. Tell us a little bit about MSAL and what it is. So MSAL, the Microsoft Authentication Libraries, are a series of libraries that we've created uh, to make the to take away the drudgery, if you will, of implementing protocol level uh, work in order to talk to an identity provider like Microsoft Identity. Mm -hmm. um, so it's our library, if you will. It's actually not, we don't like to refer to it, this is a protocol library. It does a whole lot more than just that. Um, right. But it allows you to, a developer with a very minimum amount of code, to mm -hmm. really focus on what the developer needs to worry about. Things right. like, you know, what access do I need? How do I authenticate th this user, et cetera? And take away, you know, all of the nitty gritty details that go into these protocols that not only are quite uh, detailed and long, uh, they have a huge amount of work that you have to do to follow the standard, make sure you're up to date with the standard, and so on. So we want to take all of that work away so a developer can focus on their user experience and what they right. really need to implement with respect to access, et cetera. Sweet. So I don't have to hand roll my own artisan um, library to authenticate and talk to Azure AD. I just download the MSL NuGet package and I'm good to go. Exactly. Exactly. Love it. Simplicity. Uh, now, uh, one important thing, right? MSAL is the new version of a previous library we had. Is that correct? So yes, in the uh, we used to have something called the Active Directory Authentication Library, which we refer to as ADAL. Mm -hmm. um, the Active Directory Authentication Library was targeted only at users who had corporate identities uh, ah. based off of Azure AD. Right. The Microsoft authentication libraries isn't just about Azure, but rather uh, an Azure AD. It's about any Microsoft identity. So both users with corporate identities from Azure AD, as well as identities from our consumer side of the house, what we refer to as Microsoft accounts. That could be Outlook.com or Skype.com or Xbox.com, et cetera. So anyone right. who has a consumer-based identity, uh, we can reach with our MSL libraries as well. So it's an expansion so that your application with no changes in code, no differences whatsoever, uh, can simply use uh, uh, identities from these other identity providers. Sweet. And if I remember correctly, we recently announced uh, a deprecation or sunsetting of ADL, right? We, we did. Uh, there's two things that we are uh, de deprecating uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, the first thing is the ADAL library. So, so we obviously aren't doing any new work in there. There's no features going on there in, in ADAL, and that's been the case for quite a while. Uh, but we will be deprecating that and, and ha wanting developers to move to MSOL. Uh, the other thing we're also deprecating is something called the Azure Active Directory Graph. Right. Uh, this is a precursor to what we now call Microsoft Graph. Again, the Azure Active Directory graph was targeted very specifically only at the functionality that's inside of Azure Active Directory, users right. and groups and apps and those kinds of things. Whereas the Microsoft graph gives developers access to all of the uh, investment that a company has made to drive their productivity across Microsoft 365. So not only can you get users and groups and apps, you can get mail, and calendar information and OneDrive and SharePoint, et cetera. So it's a much broader, much more powerful API uh, than just the, the focused Azure AD Graph API. So that's also been deprecated and we're asking developers to, to move to Microsoft Graph. Right, you got two years, folks. Don't worry, you don't have to start writing your code now, but we give you enough runtime to make sure that you get there on time. And we're gonna yes. have Donald Miller coming to the show 
uh, as well to talk to us about MS Graph and how you can use it within your applications and all the goodness that is around there. So uh, I download my app and uh, then I can write all different sorts of services, right? That it, and as long as it's .NET, I can use MSAL to speak to Azure AD, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Although our MSAL library is actually go past just .NET. Uh, sure. .NET is obviously our most popular environment, but we see lots of developers using Python or Java or JavaScript uh, or even mobile platforms. And we have .NET libraries for all of those, although obviously services are not appropriate on all of those uh, different uh, environments. Uh, but we have MSALs available for the developer, uh, yeah, hopefully in the environment they're developing it. Sweet. Yeah, so multi-language targets. Perfect. Yes. And what's what's special about .NET services? Well, services, uh, just, to, just to talk a little bit about services specifically, mm -hmm. um, the first thing I, I often want to think about the properties of, of the application, if you will, that, that, that in my mind makes it a service. Right. First off, of course, it has to run on a protected environment. I, I can't be doing this on a phone, regardless of how, how powerful my phone might be, that allows develop, uh, someone to be able to get at the secrets of these applications. Services right. uh, work without a user present. They use secrets and confidential information and have, are more powerful than the ones that can be limited to just a single user. So the application must run in protected environment. There's no, and there's never a user in front of it directing a service. The service is being right. run on its own logic, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and it always acts on its own behalf. Now, the way that a service identifies itself is it uses something called the client credential grant flow from right. OAuth. Um, I will point out that lots of services historically have used something called a service account, yes. which doesn't exist. It's really just a user account. Somebody says, I'm going to run this app with it. Yes. Uh, and it has all of the problems that a username and password has. Mm -hmm. uh, but nowadays, as enterprises try to move into new uh, security models where they don't even have passwords, uh, these kinds of applications, a service app, uh, account can be really problematic. So I'd like to warn developers to start thinking about how they will start moving to a client credential flow type of uh, application that we're going to talk about today uh, for right. their services over time. And are you, are you going to cover that as part of a, like you create a specific account, like a service principle with a lockdown set of permissions to be used within a specific app or are you going I'm to not because I want everyone to move to client credential flow. Right. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you, here's the steps you should do to do a okay. really good service account, at least not today. Right. Today, we're going to hear how to do it how the way you should do it uh, and not the way you, you might have to do it because of your circumstances. Right. So let's Perfect. just talk about the, 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 the better path, if you will, right now. Sounds good to me. Okay. Um, so the next question, of course, is does, how does a service actually authenticate? And there's an easy answer here. It doesn't. Because the service doesn't need to know who the service is. Uh, mm -hmm. There's self-awareness, of I suppose, right? <laughs> the service is the service. The, the sentient right? service. It's, it's right. Well, the, the, regardless of how smart or dumb the service itself is, it already knows who it is, right? right. Because it has its own identity, if you will. So yeah, we never give a service an ID token that says, here's service, here's who you are. Yeah. Right, so we don't. So instead, we only give services access tokens, and those are there obviously so that they can call APIs uh, in an authorized way. Right. We don't have to worry about any of the intricacies that come in with the other flows, like refresh toga, tokens and and auth authorization codes, because the token endpoint that a service talks to using the credential client credential flow uh, doesn't require any user interaction. No no web surfaces or anything like that. Uh, when your access token re re expires, you just make another uh, call to the endpoint to get another uh, access token. You don't need this whole process of caching refresh tokens and when do they expire and all that stuff. You don't need anything like that. Right. Um, so the real question is how does a service authorize? Well, uh -huh. first off, the service has to be able to say, I am this service. Right, mm -hmm. so it provides, if you will, an application identity, right? So that yep. is a, two components to that. The first is a client ID. We know your, you know, who 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 you are based on a client ID. You get yep. that out of your app registration, and then you have to provide your credentials in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, now we do have the support uh, because it's required by the standards to support a secret, a secret key, if you will. It's really just a string. It has the same problems as an application as a password does. Yeah. Uh, and you know, especially given the nature of these 
client credential flows, the very nature starts with, well, I got this string, I'll mail it to the developer or I'll post it in a, in a spreadsheet somewhere. I actually had a customer one time, here's all the keys we use. It's like, really? This is just a plain text spreadsheet you have of oh. all of the passwords for these services that are very powerful. So God, kind of somebody tell them about people. Yeah, exactly. So we kind of prefer that you use something like a certificate because certificate management tends to be better uh, in existence, right? People have, know how to manage certificates. Whatever process you use, we really want to see where you don't handle the secrets with people. Some automatic process puts the secret in the right place for your process, your service to use, whether it's a certificate that's been you know, automatically deployed to a VM or something, or even a, desktop, a, a, a server somewhere. Uh, those are the kinds of processes we want to see for securing these credentials, if you will. Right. So in a certificate, there's a specific way you have to do that uh, involving uh, signing a JWT token, et cetera. The good thing news here is, is while there's a lot of work there, MSOL looks after for you, so you really don't have to worry about the, the nitty gritty details of how you do that certificate authentication. It's very straightforward. That's what we'll Sweet. show you in a minute. Right. Awesome. I will point out that for if you're building your services using an Azure resource, like a, mm -hmm. a VM or an Azure function or a whole long list of, of supported Azure resources, I have a link there for you. Um, we actually offer something called Manage Identity for Azure resources. Yeah. That means you as a developer and your IT folks don't have to worry about secrets or keys or certificates or anything else. We handle all of that for you. And in fact, you don't even have to worry about MSOL because you just make a request to a well-known endpoint. This is from a VM where I simply ask, hey, Mr. Endpoint, give me a token for Microsoft Graph, and off you go. Right? So you don't even have to, to do much coding. It's a very straightforward process and a higher security. Now, it is only available today for Azure resources. So if you're running mm -hmm. somewhere else, you're running on a server in your enterprise or something like that, you can't use these. Uh, but if you are using Azure for, to host your services, I, I, I strongly encourage you to take a look at that uh, as a great way to, to have a more secure service. And, and to interject here, uh, something important is that mass identities also work in local development environments. There is a way to add that as part of the development flow so the inner circle becomes consistent. So when you move from development to production, you don't have to change your code or you don't have to change anything. It just picks That's up true. and goes from where it's going, right? Yeah, we have some client libraries that, that implement the managed identity for you uh, in your location and then they know how to fall back, uh, which is great. Nice. Master yeah. than this. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> so one other thing that the application needs, of course, is the, the application needs the right to do something or permission to, mm -hmm. do, to do its operation. Maybe I want to list all the users in the enterprise or I want to find out all the mail that was sent yesterday so I can throw it into some complicated ML thing and find out if my company is happy or sad today. Right. Uh, I might have all kinds of different needs. So the application has to state, here's what I need to do, here's what I intend to do. Right. Uh, so the way it does it, it starts with the API designer actually, because these are all about getting access to an API. Mm -hmm. So the API designer says, okay, I'm, these are my application permissions. So yep. in Microsoft Graph, we have user.read.all. This application can read the full profile of all of the users in my enterprise, for example. Yes. Then the application developer would go and go to the portal or possibly use a Graph API to specify for their in their app at the registration to say, here's the app permissions I require. Mm -hmm. Right. So they would be listed just like we do with the other ones, uh, user.read.all, great. That means this application is going to get that application permission. Remember, it has nothing to do with the user now. It's the application, and therefore all users can be read because it's not a specific user associated with this app. Right. Then the tenant admin actually has to grant the permissions ahead of time. There's no UI here. There's nothing the user gets to see because there's no user anyway. Uh, right. So all of the, the granting saying, yes, I'm allowing this service to read my mail or read my users or look at my PowerPoint, uh, my SharePoint, what have you. That's all done ahead of time by the tenant admin. Again, yeah. they can use an API, they usually use the portal, but they go ahead and create that. Uh, they, they effectively grant the permission to the application ahead of time. And then uh, the application always uses what we refer to as the dot default scope. So for example, ah, if my so application don't, don't has been granted some permissions to Microsoft Graph, it uses right. graph.com slash dot default. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I don't ask for the scopes uh, one by one. I just say default, and then it's the operating station that looks after that, right? Yeah, I kind of like to think of the dot default. I can use this um, for any application. It okay. kind of says, 
why don't you go to the to my app registration and do what I would refer to as the the scope or permission math. Figure wow. out what I need based on what I'm calling and maybe I'm calling an API that needs another permission, et cetera. Go ahead and figure that, all that out for me and give me what I need. So would you call that efficiency or laziness? Like as a developer, do I want <laughs> you to put my scopes in my app and then call them? I mean, if, if I'm not writing a service, for example, let's say I'm creating a web app, or do I go with default all the time? Because people may be asking that. It would depend upon the nature of you, the user experience you're going for. So it becomes a tool in the developer's uh, pocket for how am I driving my user experience. Now, if I'm a line of business developer whose scopes are always pre-consented by my tenant admin anyway, I might as well use dot default. Right. If I'm a multi-tenant uh, multi application developer, I'm selling my app across different tenants, maybe I want to be able to have different tiers of the app. So right. maybe I uh, maybe I have an app that only needs these three, three, three permissions for a big chunk of it, and maybe it only needs these other three in particular circumstances. And who knows? Maybe that my cut this particular customer never even bought those other three. So gotcha. by using the what we call dynamic scopes or dynamic mm -hmm. permissions, uh, in conjunction often with incremental. So dynamic says I'm going to tell you the permissions I need, uh, regardless of what I've told you I might use in my app registration. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to know this is what I need right now. And maybe ah. that's the only thing I sold to the developer. So that's why a developer is not so much for a service because a service is kind of all nobody's looking at a UI. What's sure. the, app, the user experience for a server? Well, there isn't one. <laughs> um, so I don't really need to optimize it much. Yeah. But if I'm a user in front of it and I'm using mm -hmm. what we call delegated permissions, I might want to really fine tune exactly when the user gets prompted for, for permissions. Gotcha. So, for example, maybe I have an application that says I'm helping you manage OneDrive, and the first thing to do if the app started up and says I'd like to write to your calendar, you'd go, oh, why would you do that? Mm -hmm. But if at some point in time I pop a, a note to the user saying, hey, I noticed that uh, uh, you know X number of your files have been not touched in a year, do you want me to set a reminder to have you come and clean up these the, 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 so I can help you clean them up? Sure, go ahead and set the reminder. Hey, can yes. I write to your calendar? That would be uh, a way you would want to do that. Very nice, thank you. Okay, so let's take a quick look at a demo of uh, how I might implement a service. Uh, I'm going to use uh, a .NET Core application here that the uh, the, uh, the demo, the links in the slide uh, show you where I got both the tutorial and the, the the code here from. It's right out of our our samples and our tutorials. So obviously, we usually do this uh, kind of a demo with a se secret key which mm -hmm. I just told you a few minutes ago you don't really want to use. So let me try to do this in a little bit more correct way. So the code we're going to run through in this case is obviously I need to read the certificate. I'm reading this on my local machine uh, as, a, as a console app here on my local machine. So right. I've already uh, distributed, if you will, this certificate to this the, to my machine here. So I just need to go and uh, get my certificate out of, of certificate storage. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to pass that to this confidential client. So we're building a confidential client, which is using the client credential flow. Right, so right. I'm saying I have a service. It's a confidential client, respect in the way we, we enable things here in MSOL. So here I'm instantiating my MSOL application by saying I want to create it. Here's my identifier for the application. Again, I need to know the, I, the, the app's name, if you will, by this client ID. Okay. Uh, I'm, here's my certificate that you're going to use to, to, to properly tell uh, Microsoft Identity who this application is by right. doing this complicated signing a JOT thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this is just which applicate which uh, which tenant I'm talking to. So in this right. case, I'm talking to the tenant where the app is registered. The only other thing I'm going to do is we've gone ahead in our configuration here. I've said uh, which which my application the, the app I'm calling is Microsoft Graph. Right. This identifies the tenant. Then I identify the client ID. Um, so we're getting these all just out of a configuration. And there's the name of the cert I'm using uh, that we got out of my certificate store. Very nice. So, what we're going to do here is we're just going to take that uh, app uh, URL, the API URL, which in this case was Microsoft, uh, sorry, graph.microsoft.com, and we're going to add that .default, which is what we would always do for a service. Yep. And then it becomes a very straightforward process. I simply, and I'm going to use this acquire token for client. Right. It's going to build me a, a, an object that I can then execute asynchronously. Mm -hmm. That's going to return to me the 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 response the token response 
I'm going to take a, a quick look at that when we get there. So actually, let's wait for that. We'll go here. But I sure. go ahead and now I'm going to, going to go acquire that. And then from there on, all I really need to do is call my APIs and give it the access token, which is in the response. So and here, let's look here. I'm calling nice. an API. What that really means is I'm going to create an authorization header. Mm -hmm. And that authorization header is going to have this value of a bearer with the access token. Sweet. Right, so I passed that access token that I got from Microsoft Identity to call the API. Very and nice. uh, now if I call this uh, th th this API, it knows how to, to check to see if it's... So what MSOL is coming in for me, MSOL is basically got these two APIs. Uh, the first off, I'm creating the MSOL object. Yep. I don't call that an API, sort of not. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second one is this, acquire token for, for client. That's all I really need from MSOL. The rest of it's got, MSOL is going to handle for me. Uh, but it hand, it, this one hides a lot of complexity behind the scenes. So these five lines or four lines of code hide a lot of code, yes. boilerplate code that otherwise you would have to roll out yourself and you don't want to do that. Right. If, if I was doing this at the protocol level, I'd be off trying to figure out how to create a JOT and how to sign a JOT. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I have to go through the, the, the actual flow of the client credential. It, it, there's a bunch of work I'd have to do. Yeah, uh, which obviously, you know, I don't want to do. No, it's just the five lines of code I want to use. Perfect. That's right. Exactly. So let's go ahead and 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 run the app. Uh huh. And let me make sure it's not popping up on the other monitor. So uh, I actually didn't want to check. Oh, so this is just checking. You know, I'm getting my certificate, so I got my certificate. That that worked fine. So I'll just go ahead and let that go. Um, so now I've gone ahead and acquired a token. What I want to look at here. Uh, is the result um, just to show you what this is really if you were looking for you know how do I debug I, I'm getting a four uh, an access denied from my uh, oops popped up on my other monitor let me bring it over here so I'm getting an access denied you know how do I do it well the first response for most developers is oh I'm just going to take a look at the token surely it's just a job token I can just look at it Right. I, I'm gonna, even though you can do that, I'm going to try to discourage people from doing that okay. because if you do, there's, there may be a point in time where you will no longer be able to read the access tokens like you can right. today. So if we start putting protection on those access tokens, that debugging technique you've gotten so used to won't be there anymore. So yes, instead, yes, yes. I look at the token response, there's my scopes, and okay. I can see that what I got was exactly what I asked for graph.microsoft.com right. slash default. So that's really telling me if you want to see if your permissions are right, go look in the portal because that's where they are. Right. Right. Uh, and here you can see the rest of the information that I, I see in the token response. I'll also point out the correlation ID, really mm -hmm. important to log. If you want to log anything, log this. Because mm -hmm. with the correlation ID, our support people go, go and look up that transaction. With the, hey, I ran an app two days ago and it didn't work. Could you tell me what happened? We don't mm -hmm. really do well tracing those down, but with a correlation ID, we do that great. And that's not in the access token or anywhere else. It's oh. right here uh, in the correlation ID of the response, as well as things like when it expires and so on. So I have no need to ever look inside this access token. This access token was issued for Microsoft Graph. They're the only people who should be looking inside of it. The right. information I need as a developer, both to just to, to run, like if I'm say, how long should I attach the token for? Mm -hmm. Well, here's where it expires. Or to debug, here's the scopes it got, uh, here's the correlation ID if I need to open a case. All of that comes in the token response. Very nice. So I just wanted Very to nice. point that out. Now we'll go ahead and continue. Uh, and uh, let me go and grab the app. All it did was uh, it called our user API for Microsoft Graph. Uh, so I simply here I have a list of current users. And look, Christos is actually in my tenant. I don't know oh, what he's doing. Wow. I, 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 second day on the job. Hey, do you have a tenant I can use? <laughs> it's still there. What? It's still uh, there. What the heck? Um, so in, in any case, I guess we'll let that slide. Uh, <laughs> and it's only so, I don't have much of uh, power there. That's right. You're, you're just a user in the test tenant. Just a so user. that's a, a very quick look at It's not a lot of code. That's the great thing. Even though I talked a lot about yeah. you know things like services and properties, I ended up with two API calls. Create me yeah. a, 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 a confidential client app from MSOL, and yo, MSOL, get me a token for this app now. That's all I had to do. Yeah, I think there was more code to actually retrieve the certificate or to actually do the call to the graph rather than authenticating and getting the access token to do these things. 
which yeah, is Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So just to sum up, a service, of course, needs to run in a secure environment. So if you use something like mzol.net and try to use to say, oh, I'm just going to put a service on my iPhone. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're not going to let that happen. So we, we prevent confidential clients on things like uh, mobile devices, uh, single page web apps, and uh, even UWPs. Um, what you do need to do is you have to authorize via your client credentials. Again, if possible, use managing your identity for Azure resources. It's, it's a lot simpler and okay. more secure. Or a certificate, preferably, because there's usually management around a certificate. And then the fallback would be secrets. But we really, really, really hope that you have some management process in place so that those secrets aren't just strings that are passed around in email or spreadsheets on a server or check, just checked into GitHub. Yeah, uh, and we see those as well. And then finally, of course, a service uses app application permissions. So you do that in the portal, uh, and, and that's how you get your application set up. Awesome. So much uh, goodness here, especially for uh, developers that work with uh, .NET and .NET Core. And these days, you know, you can run on Linux or Windows, doesn't really matter. So it's open source. There, There is a lot of potential there for people to create background uh, tasks using .NET Core. Uh, and it's nice to know how to do it right and securely and don't not expose uh, unnecessary secrets and stuff to your um, to potential attackers. So Kyle, that was brilliant. Thank you very much for coming Thanks. to the show and explaining what secrets are and uh, what uh, services uh, and how to be used in .NET Core with Azure AD. So I appreciate your time. Thank you again. Okay. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Have a nice day, everyone.